This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Our reading this evening is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. It's page 1014 in the Pew Bibles if you want to follow along. So Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Amen. Evening. Uh, my name's Paul, I'm one of the elders here, and uh, we've been doing a series on encounters with Jesus through the summer, and um, James um, McClure was on last week, and he's going through John 8, and the woman who was caught in adultery. And this week we're in Mark's Gospel in chapter 10, and as Valerie read, verses 17 to 22, looking at the young man with many possessions, his encounter with Jesus, his reaction and to what Jesus said about entering, entering the kingdom of God. I think in a way, uh, afterwards, if you go home, if you read right up to the end of the passage, 31, um, I might be, uh, give you a, a further background, and I think it connects into what that this piece is about as well. So if you want to do that, you're welcome to. Um, but before we go any further, um, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand what Jesus wants to hear from tonight. Let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to look at your word, given to us by and through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh, may we know your spirit of truth guiding us. We would ask you, Holy Spirit, to show us the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. Lord, help us to understand how your life as a sinless man, but also as a holy God, enables us to have eternal life so we can live eternally with you. Help us to know the impossible things you can do for us and through us. For your glory and the glory of the Father. Amen. So we're looking at, it's widely known, the story of the, the rich young ruler. Um, Matthew's, Matthew's gospel, he mentions he's young and look that he's a ruler, but Mark describes him slightly differently here uh, in that the term young man can be, he uses can be interpreted as simply as one or a certain person. And this is typical of, of Mark's tendency to keep the stories applicable to uh, as possible for all readers. If Mark was about today, you could maybe see him doing lots of YouTube shorts or Instagram reels um, to try and move the gospel message along to people. Well, I haven't got any YouTube shorts. Uh, you may be shocked to hear I'm not a YouTube influencer. Um, so we're going to look at the passage broadly in three parts. Uh, young man and Jesus, Jesus and the young man, and Jesus and us. So the young man and Jesus, Billy Graham um, said this about him. The young man came with the right question to the right man and received the right answer, but made the wrong decision. The young man came with the right question to the right man and received the right answer, but made the wrong decision. Something to note at the start here, I thought, was a phrase in verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, it was Jesus' journey, but where to? Where was he heading? Where was he going? It could be translated as his road or his way. So he's heading to the cross, and Mark is hinting this right at the start of this passage. So the young man's approach to Jesus, well, in verse 17, it says, As we were setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He runs up to Jesus and falls at his knees before, on his knees before him, 
It's a very public act of reverence and deference and humiliation, or hum humility. Sorry. He would be aware of how this would have been um, seen by those who were watching him at the time. It seems he might have been maybe waiting for Jesus or he, he, Jesus was about to leave and he thought, this is my chance to talk to him. I need to grasp this chance. And the question he asked Jesus was a significant one. It's one that Jesus hadn't been asked either by the disciples or the religious establishment up to that point. It was actually a question of great importance, capable of revealing the meaning of Jesus' ministry. When Jesus tells a young man to keep the commandments, he replies, he has. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Now this might seem a bit arrogant to us and maybe hypocritical of the young man. Uh, to bring his moral report card to Jesus and like, I've kept all these A stars. Uh, to really keep all the commandments? Well, the runic teaching of the time the young man would, that the young man would have had, he was brought up and it would have firmly established the ability to keep the commandments was possible. Keeping the Torah was considered an achievable path. So it could be, it would have been something that he would have been taught from his youth. Um, it was, that it was possible to gain eternal life by keeping the law. So you may have generally believed that he had kept the law. Paul in, in Philippians uh, 3 and 16, talking about his Jewish heritage and pedigree, says about himself, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, according to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. Uh, the rich were considered by Jewish society as being the most likely to gain eternal life, which explains the disciples' reaction later on in the, in the chapter in verses 24 and 26, when uh, the amazed Jesus said it's hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And yet, and yet here the young man was asking Jesus this question. He obviously felt that he hadn't gained eternal life, or why would he ask it? Had, he been non, had it been known away at him? Um, he said, I've been religious as can be, but still there's something missing. So what was Jesus' response then to the young man's question? Well, he doesn't answer it. Instead, he asks another, one that is probably unexpected. I was thinking sometimes when you pray, um, you ask Jesus a question and answer for prayer, eager for him, what's the answer, what's the answer? But he comes back to you with another question. Um, maybe perhaps because like here, there's something we need to understand first. If you look at verse 18, it says, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus had not up to now been keeping his messianic identity under wraps, throwing a veil over it, as it were. He had come as a servant and not as a ruler to reign as a powerful sovereign, earthly sovereign. In Judaism, only God is characteristically called good. And rabbis were, were happy with lots of titles, um, but shied away from being called a good rabbi. They feared being accused of blasphemy against God. And so when Jesus, and so Jesus, when he states to the young man, only God is good, he's very directly pointing him to God. No one is good except God alone. It could also be read as no one is good except the one God. And this is from Deuteronomy 5 where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Did Jesus think of himself as good then? One commentator describes it in this way. The father was all in all to the son. And the son no more thought of his own goodness than an honest man thinks of his honesty. When the good man sees goodness, he thinks of his own evil. Jesus had no evil to think of, but neither does he think of his goodness. He delights in his father's. Jesus was doing the father's will. He was only concerned that the father would get the glory. Fulfilling the father's wishes, his will being done. So Jesus is essentially saying to the young man, you're saying I'm good? Well, only the, the God of the Bible is good. So you're saying I'm God? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you really believe? Do you believe I'm God? You nearly do like a mic drop, as the one's doing now it is. I was going, was going to get one to drop here, but then I thought I might get charged by the church committee for it. I think no, I'm joking. Um, do you find... Jesus, uh, uh, sorry, do you find that uh, Jesus asks that of us sometimes? Uh, you're saying, I'm, I'm God. Do you really believe that? Why are you worried about this sin? Or why are you annoyed about that? Um, if you believe I'm God, then what's the problem? 
And after trying to make out the implication of the way the young man has addressed Jesus, he then gives him an answer to this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In uh, verse 19, he says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So Jesus gives a young man a list or a digest of the ethical commandments um, stated in Exodus 20, 12, 26, and also Deuteronomy 5, 16 to 20. Um, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear, bear false witness against your neighbor. Now there's one difference that Jesus makes to that list. He includes in the answer to the young man that he's not to defraud. Why does he add this instead of me, do not covet? It should be said that in scripture there are other examples where some commandments are dropped off a list. They're not all always grouped together. In Romans 13 and 9, for example, Paul only includes four, adultery, murder, theft, and coveting. Do not defraud is not found in the Ten Commandments. Why why does Jesus include it? Well, he might have added it to the young man being rich, uh, since wealth, especially, especially in Israel at the time, was often gained at the expense of the poor. Uh, Deuteronomy 24 and 14 says, You shall not oppress a hard worker. Jesus' response to the young man suggests that despite his moral zeal, uh, or perhaps because of it, um, something is lacking in his relationship with God. Jesus is trying to move him beyond his confidence in keeping the law, his uh, works of righteousness, as it were, to the ultimate purpose of life, which is to know God and to enjoy him forever. Jesus then hears his response and he said to him, Teacher, all these th- I've kept from my youth. And as we mentioned earlier, it could be, we could think it's arrogant, but Jesus didn't pull him up on it, um, or that, wasn't, that he wasn't understanding the law correctly. No, Jesus just loved him. In verse 21 it says, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. The original meaning for uh, looking at him here is more intense. It means to look intently, to scrutinize or to examine. So Jesus isn't being fooled here. He isn't having the world pulled over his eyes. He's not being deceived. Jesus sees the inside of the man and loved him. Jesus looking at him with love doesn't challenge the assumption that if you follow the law perfectly, you would be assured of eternal life. But he teaches something quite different, that even if the law were kept, the most essential thing is still lacking. And Jesus, in verse 21, and Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Jesus is what he lacks. Jesus is what the law can't give. And how ironic is the kingdom of God, where earlier in the chapter, in verses 13 to 15, uh, it says, and they were bringing children to him, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and said to them, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child shall not enter it. So the children who possess nothing are told they don't lack anything, but instead the kingdom of God is theirs. And this young man who possessed everything in the world's term still lacks something. Only when he sells everything he has and becomes like a vulnerable child will he possess everything. To get what he wants for the future, eternal life, he must do something now, and that is give up all he has and follow Jesus. This might be why Jesus particularly included the command, do not defraud, in his answer to the young man. The young man giving up his possessions was his act of repentance. To follow Jesus, he had to repent. Uh, In Luke 13, verse 34, Jesus says, No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And Peter, preaching in Acts 2 and 38, said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had looked at him, seen deep inside his soul, and pinpointed the thing that was stopping him repenting and following Jesus. The law can only be fulfilled in discipleship with Jesus. Without Jesus, the law is incomplete incomplete and futile. In verses 17 and 20, the young man had great confidence. As long as he stands on his own merits, he's self-assured. But Jesus' words call him out from his safe place. 
You can see his confidence going in verse 22. Disheartened by this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Mark's original word for the young man's reaction is very descriptive. It's conveying that he's appalled, shocked, or that he's overcast as the sky. The clouds had rolled in on his life, and he saw clearly what the price of eternal life was for him. It was like a parable of the seeds in Mark 4, 19. And the seedfulness of riches enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Someone then who leads an exemplary life, who even endears himself to the Son of God, can still be an idolater. You see, the young man was looking for something he could do to obtain eternal life. He had tried the law, but he felt he needed to do something else. But he needed Jesus. He needed to follow the Son of God. This good teacher, who was God, to follow him, he needed nothing, which is why he had to give up everything. I want to comment briefly on scriptural attitude to wealth and poverty. Um, don't worry, I'm not getting into prosperity gospel and all that. Uh, it's just two, two small things can be said about scriptural attitude to possessions. One, it was a sign of, of blessing. In Job 1 and 10, verse 10, it says, You have blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. And two, the Old Testament champions the poor, the sojourner, the widow, the orphan, and the fatherless. First Samuel 2 it says there were lo- those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes. Jesus especially sides with the poor, needy, and bereft because compassion, uh, compassion that God exalts the poor above the rich and powerful. Jesus, who is God and is deserving all honor and praise, became nothing for us. We are lifted up through his death and resurrection to be with God in heaven. The, the great exchange has been said. The poor raised up to be with the Prince of Peace. Jesus isn't upholding poverty as an ideal um, in this passage, but emphasizes the greatest enemy to faith and obedience are self-satisfaction and pride. And verse 22 ends with the man turning away from Jesus with great sadness. I don't know if you know someone who, uh, who's maybe had one thing that they found just they couldn't uh, give up to follow Jesus. Um, I work with a man uh, called Wilson and he could quote the Bible to you with, with ease. He had grown up in the Salvation in Army uh, and he loved brass bands and he played the trumpet. Um, we had quite a few conversations but the thing um, that he said he couldn't give up was alcohol. He had left the Salvation Army in his teenage years and never went back. And I, I would say he's not like he couldn't get through a day without having alcohol. He knew everything he needed to know uh, about the gospel, um, but he couldn't give that up. Um, when he's retiring, he uh, or discussing, he's saying goodbye. He uh, he said, "I know Paul. I know what I have to do, but it's impossible for me." Uh, that was about 15, 16 years ago. So that brings uh, us, uh, me to Jesus and us. And what can we take this passage to apply to our lives? Well, I don't think anyone here who will have claimed to keep, uh, have kept the law perfectly. Uh, Donald Trump might, but we won't go there. Um, some things then for, uh, for us to consider. Uh, first, whenever we come to God seeking an answer to the question we want, he will remind us that he is God. Especially when it concerns salvation. Young man was wanting instructions to inherit and gain eternal life. And the first thing Jesus challenged him was, was do you really believe I'm God? So for us, we're to remember something pretty obvious, but maybe something we also forget in our desire for the answers we'll want. Second thing is Jesus will see right through us, um, but he will also look at us with love. As he scrutinized the young man and pinpointed the thing that was stopping him following him, he also loved him. And when we come to Jesus, he will know what that thing is, the sin that's most precious to us. He will bring it front and center, as he did with the young man. He will do this as an act of love. To have eternal life, to enjoy God forever, means following Jesus. He doesn't want us to perish. He wants us to follow him. And he'll show us the thing that we have to let go of. Um, Thirdly, to follow Jesus, 
Everything we have highlights everything we lack. To follow Jesus, everything we have is everything we lack if it's keeping us from following him. We won't be in any doubt about it. Jesus will have made it plain what needs to go, what decisions decision, sorry, we need, we'll have to make. And as Billy Graham said, the young man came with the right question to the right man and received the right answer, but made the wrong decision. So what's your decision? Remember Wilson I mentioned earlier? About six years ago we got word uh, he had died and a few of us went from work to his funeral. I was down at Clark's funeral home in Newton Orange, I don't know if you know it, and I was taken by a local uh, Baptist pastor. I was sitting down uh, wondering what he's going to say about Wilson and his address. And he started talking about the spiritual discussions he had with Wilson, and particularly those in the last two and a half years. That was when Wilson had given his life to Jesus. I was totally amazed and overwhelmed. God had saved Wilson. Wilson, by God's grace, had managed to give up his greatest possession, the thing that was stopping him following Jesus. I should have remembered verse 27 further down the chapter. With man, it's, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. If you're not a follower of Jesus but want eternal life, ask Jesus what you need to give up, repent, before to gain him. If you are a follower of Jesus, remember who he is, what he's done. Nothing is impossible for him. That family member, relative, partner, friend who does know Jesus, keep praying. Keep praying that they will come to the good teacher who can and has done the impossible. Let's pray. Lord, we're so glad you make us remember that you died the death that wasn't yours but ours, that you took our sin and its punishment of death. But being holy God, you came through death to life again so we might have a new body, a new earth, and a new heaven to live with you eternally. We praise and thank you for so great a salvation. Lord, we're so thankful. You know our names, and we are eternally yours. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.